Okay, guys. Hello. I think it's a good time to start. No? My name is Katerina Chaton, and I will try to help you to finalize the course in industrial organization. I know that it's quite some worries for you about the course, yeah, because we have quite short time before the exam. But still, we will try our best. So, to start, I think that we should start with the topics for exam. This document lies in the folder lecture notes. Um, here. And this is your pencil for the coming exam. Um, well, uh, the end of the whole story will be the chapter 14. Huh? As long as I know Ariel has covered the material up to chapter 9. Yeah? So today we will um, cover these first five pages of, of chapter 10, then go for chapter 11, uh, and then I think, according to my plan at least, we should be able to cover all this material tomorrow. We have three hours, and probably partially Tuesday. We have two hours. Yeah? And my plan is that the last lecture on Friday and all the remaining time we will devote to solving exercises. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, my suggestion is the following. Uh, you can send me emails with your suggestions, what you want to go through again before the exam. Mm -hmm. Therefore, please, this weekend, use this time to go through this stuff and to decide where you have problems, which models you want to go through again. Probably it should be some, it can be some concepts from game theory, whatsoever. So you point out, I prepare, and we go through that next week. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Yeah. And this is my email. In this document, I put asterisks here and here. What does it mean? I would suggest the following, that you focus on this chapter 8 and this part 3 of chapter 13, because these are two sources of problems to solve on exam. Mm -hmm. The most of solvable exercises can come from these two places. I would say that everything that goes before chapter 8 is more or less like preliminary material to understand what is going on here. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you make sure that you understand that, but there is actually no reason to try to memorize that that's ha that hard. Just try to understand. Yeah? Then go properly through this chapter, and I think I will help you next week with that. Uh, here as well, this is an important thing in terms of game theory. Yeah? You may face some questions from here. Uh, these two chapters, uh, I would say that uh, they have quite advanced models, but still this all is about their strategies to deter entry. Mm -hmm. So again, it more or less uh, will come as a theoretical questions in your exam. Mm -hmm. Here we have a model, Bertrand model, with product differentiation. Mm -hmm. Again, in part three, uh, you may f have problem to solve from this part as well. Mm -hmm. In your exam, for sure, you will have a couple of solvable exercises and probably one or two theoretical questions. Mm -hmm. The question would be, yeah? I'm sorry, uh, did you say 8 to 14 or 8 and 14? What do you mean? Okay, well, for your exam, everything is relevant that stays here. Yeah. I'm just pointing on the stuff where you can get exercises to solve on exam. Okay. This one and this one. Everything else, most likely, will go as theoretical questions. For example, you may be asked, um, explain what might be the pricing strategies to deter entry, or 
which non-pricing strategies you know, for example, like that. Um, you may be asked to explain how you understand the prisoner's dilemma, for example, in application to some particular case, these sort of things. You may be asked how you understand the difference between um, monopolistic market, market and competitive markets, this, this thing. Yeah? But again, everything that is not clear, you write me a message, and we go through that Tuesday and Friday. Mm -hmm. One more important thing. Many of you were a bit worried about the possibility of getting 30% of your grade for sure uh, by writing a compulsory assignment. So it is already there in the folder exercises. Mm -hmm. You have this assignment 2014. It notice that it is not called compulsory assignment because this is just an assignment. This is up to you to decide whether you want or no to solve that. Deadline is December 4th. So yes, it is after your exam. So the logic is the following. You can try to solve exam if you see that it did not go that well. You can try to solve this assignment to increase your grade. Mm -hmm. uh, and it should be uploaded in Fronter if you want to get it graded. Yeah? It is fairly, OK, I, I would say that, first of all, it's much shorter that uh, is usually given to students in industrial organization class. At least I remember that three years ago when I took the class, we had to write a big, big essay on OPEC pricing and all the thing. And in addition to that, the number of exercises is shorter. Mm -hmm. So therefore, enjoy. I think it's quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you have any other questions uh, on our arrangements? Hmm? Uh, about service. Uh, sorry, we will cover a question about survey, for instance. We will cover all chapters, what, we, uh, what are listed there. OK, I would say that the question can pop up from anything here. Yeah? But again, I would say that everything that comes before this point is more or less your background. Mm -hmm. These chapters are important for you to understand what is going on here. Mm -hmm. So theoretical questions would come probably from, from this part. Mm -hmm. So first lecture. Mm -hmm. One important thing. I prefer to have a dialogue with you. So if there is at least anything that is unclear on the lecture, please do stop me, do participate, ask questions. And one more important thing is that I have a strong inclination to talk too fast. <laughs> Therefore, please stop me, really. Well, cartels in action. Um, in chapter 9, you went through prisoner's dilemma. What is this? Prisoner's dilemma is usually a game of this type. We have two players. Say this is player two, this is player one. Mm -hmm. And both of these players, they have two strategies. One strategy is to collude, and another one is to defect. And the same for another one. And these are the payoffs. If both collude, then we get 100 payoff for both. If one colludes, another one defects, the one that defects gets payoff higher than those who decide to uh, collude. Here the situation is other way around. If both decide to defect, they have equal payoff, but smaller than in collusion. Why it is called dilemma? What is very particular about this type of game? Uh, if we look for an equilibrium in this game, what we get? Say we say if player one decides to collude, 
then player two decides uh, what is his optimal action. So if this colludes, then player two thinks to himself, if I collude, I get 100. If I defect, I get 120. Mm -hmm. So this one is better. So we put star here. Mm -hmm. Then player two thinks to himself again, well, what happens if player one decides to defect? In this case, if I collude, I get 25. If I defect, I get 80. Again, if I choose between these two numbers, I'm better off by employing this strategy. Now we put on shoes of player one. He decides what to do. Mm -hmm. So he thinks about the strategies of player two. If he decides to collude, then what is better for me to do? If I collude, I get 100. If I defect, I get 120. So I'm better off uh, playing this. Mm -hmm. If player two defects, the player one decides between 25 and 80. And of course, he decides for 80. So it looks like the following, that for player one, whatever happens with decisions of player two, he is always better off by defecting. Mm -hmm. And the same story happens for player two. Whatever player one decides to do, he's always better off by defecting as well. So and this is the only Nash equilibrium in the game. Mm -hmm. But what is the dilemma then? The dilemma is that if they decided to collude, they could get 100. They could increase their payoff. But their dominant strategies are to defect. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the problem of prisoner's dilemma, and especially on the market, is the following, that f say two oligopolists, two large firms, they understand that if we uh, manage to coordinate, we can increase our payoffs. Mm -hmm. But if we decide to stay on safe ground, if I want to make sure that whatever happens, I'm better off, then both will go defecting. Yeah? And then uh, they decrease their payoff. Therefore, the main problem is how to sustain this coordination. Mm -hmm. In order to sustain this coordination, for example, in the cartel, we have to uh, think about two uh, issues. The first one, I should have the opportunity to, uh, de to detect who is the cheater. Mm -hmm. Say so here we have a game of only two players. But this may be the case when I have three, four, five players. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, how can I understand who cheats? Mm -hmm. The fact of cheating is actually easily recognizable. Because if someone, OK, say we play this outcome. Mm -hmm. We managed to sustain this outcome for quite some time. And then suddenly, someone decided to defect. Because he understands, if I defect at least only once, I suddenly can increase my payoff. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that uh, everybody else in this cartel, they will feel that something bad has happened because their payoff will go down from here to here. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they want, they need to have a mechanism, a device that will point out who was this cheater. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, OK, to understand who is the cheater is not quite the end of the story. We need one more mechanism to punish the one who cheats. Mm -hmm. So how this mechanism should work? In a way, with this punishment, we should assign some penalty. Mm -hmm. If we assign some penalties, say here, we say that if you cheat, you pay 30 million more. Mm -hmm. Then he will think to himself, OK, I can increase my payoff, but then I will have to pay 30 million. That means that we simply decrease his payoff. And now we change a bit the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. So this may work uh, as an incentive to sustain the coordination. Mm -hmm. But it, it works really very well on the board, on the blackboard. Yeah? But what happens in the real life? It's not that easy. So the most famous application of this cartel behavior, uh, the most famous or infamous example, is the OPEC, mm -hmm. the Organization of Ex Petroleum Exporting Countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can look at this cartel 
and its history through the lenses of dominant firm price leadership model. Mm -hmm. This is one of the uh, approaches how to sustain the coordination and how to find the solution to this prisoner's dilemma game. Mm -hmm. So the idea is the following. Um, we have a cartel and there is one participant in this cartel. In this case, this is Saudi Arabia. That is the largest producer. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, many others who are much smaller. This is Kuwait, Venezuela, Algeria, Qatar, Gabon, Ecuador, and so on. So there's a long list of them. Uh, how the whole thing works? Say they agreed upon some certain price. And of course, they agreed upon collusion. We say that if we restrict our output a little bit, mm -hmm, then we create sort of a deficit on the market. And therefore, we push the price up. Mm -hmm. If we push the prices up, then we get higher uh, profit. So if we agree to restrict the output among all the participants in the cartel, we can get rather high payoff, mm -hmm, rather high profit. If we don't agree upon that, if we just decide that each of us produces as much as he wants, then we get to, the, to uh, this outcome of the game, uh, where our profit, because of lower prices, we have lower profits. Mm -hmm. The only problem uh, with this OPEC story is that, say, Saudi Arabia, it has an incentive to keep their high price. But each of the small participants, they have incentives to um, increase their output at least once. Because I know that, OK, well, uh, I collude, I coordinate, but if at least once I really cheat and I produce more than agreed, I can immediately increase my payoff. Mm -hmm. At least once I can earn more. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that uh, I understand that I'm a very, very small country. Is that if I increase my output, it looks that I will not actually influence the prices on the market that much. Mm -hmm. So I accept this price or I perceive this price uh, as a fixed one. Mm -hmm. And the, the, thing, the following thing happens, that everybody around, around Saudi Arabia thinks the same. They think to themselves that if I increase my payoff, nothing will happen with the price. But Saudi Arabia understands that it will happen. Mm -hmm. And then in order to sustain this price on the high level, it has to decrease its own output, mm -hmm. just to keep it high. And this is how the whole thing works. But in addition to that, there is one more issue, is that there are as well other producers, say Canada, US, at that point when uh, APEC started its operation, it was in the 70s. As well, there was uh, USSR, mm, Soviet Union, as well a large producer of oil. And all of them are not in the cartel. They don't want to, at least they don't have incentives to collude or to coordinate with OPEC. And this is the way how the whole thing works. Say any other country, in this uh, example, this is uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. It thinks, well, the APEC has set up a price. And for me, this price is parametric. I just take it as given. And I know that with my tiny output, I will not influence this price. So my decision does not influence the price on the market. Therefore, this is a straight line here. Mm -hmm. Whatever happens with my output, this is always here. And then I look at my marginal costs and my average costs. Mm -hmm. and as I'm a profit maximizer, I decide to produce output that is exactly equal to my marginal cost uh, with this price. Mm -hmm. So I find the intersection, and this is my Q1. Mm -hmm. So and um, this is, so to say, a competitive output. And now you can imagine the lo logic that, well, if everybody around the cartel starts to uh, produce this competitive output with the same price, or even to try to lower the price a little bit, then the market share of this cartel decreases. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what happened with Saudi Arabia 
after 1982. Can you imagine that in 1982 they produced around 6.5 uh, billion of uh, barrel of oil per day. In 1985 they reduced the output for 2 billion per day. Mm -hmm. And they had to do that just to sustain this high price. Because other countries, uh, non-OPEC members, they follow this logic. They produce a lot. Yeah? In addition to that, all small members of OPEC as well they think that this price will always be there. Mm -hmm. Therefore they as well start to increase, they start cheating like here. And Saudi Arabia, in order to sustain this, as a, uh, this price, either as a dominant firm price leader, they had to uh, keep the price on, on their own expenses, to reduce the output. So when they uh, reached this limit of 2 billion barrels per day, they decided, OK, that's enough for, for us. We cannot do it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, in, at this moment, their market share was 55%. Already at this moment, it was only 30%. Mm -hmm. This looks quite some amount of money. So at that mo point of time, they decided, well, now we will work uh, not to sustain the price, but to mi maintain our market share. Mm -hmm. So they uh, simply changed the strategy. And when they decided, OK, now we produce as much as we want, suddenly the price dropped for $10 per, per bar barrel in 1986. Mm -hmm. What happens with this price? Many marginal fields, uh, do you understand what is marginal field? Uh, say we have a petroleum deposit. We know that there is some oil or gas inside there. Uh, but it costs quite a lot to start to develop that. This is some setup costs. Mm -hmm. And if the price on the market is sufficiently high, then this cost will be covered if I develop this deposit. Mm -hmm. uh, but if the amount of gas there is quite small and the price is low, then I, I understand that if I start to develop this petroleum deposit, I will get a loss. Therefore, it, it stays there and waits until um, the, the market conditions are better. These fields are usually called marginal, mm -hmm. something that on the margin, the margin of, of the price. So when this price went down to this historically lowest level, many of these marginal fields were closed just because the, the cost threshold uh, was passed. Mm -hmm. They had to close a lot of production that suddenly turned out to be unprofitable. And because of that, market share of Saudi Arabia started to grow again. Mm -hmm. Now we come back to, say, theoretical implications of this model. It looks like in, this, in the whole this story, there was, there was no punishment. Yeah? It looks like Saudi Arabia really understood who cheats. Probably it was Minnesota or whomsoever. Yeah? But they didn't punish. Why so? We can look at this game payoff. It's not quite prisoner's dilemma uh, because cooperate, uh, no, high price for Saudi Arabia is a dominant strategy. Mm -hmm. Look, yeah, like that. It's always better than playing low price. And look now, say, uh, this is one of the small OPEC members. And if they too cooperate, so Saudi, Ar Saudi Arabia keeps the price on, and Venezuela cooperates, then we get uh, 10,000 profit for Saudi Arabia and 500 for Venezuela. If this small guy defects, then of course the profit of Saudi Arabia decreases, and Venezuela can earn twice as much as was with cooperation. So it looks like Saudi Arabia has an incentive to punish, mm, to suddenly go to low prices. But this is the problem, that if uh, Saudi Arabia exercises this strategy, we suddenly get to the point when it loses 2,000. Mm -hmm. 
it looks like too much. So it costs me too much to punish this guy. Therefore, I, I decide, okay, well, let me just keep how, it's go, how it goes. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what happened. So for us, what we can get from this, that uh, in order to sustain cooperation, at least to some extent, we can find a price leader, a very large firm, a dominant firm in the industry, uh, the one that has high incentives uh, to keep the price on, mm, to sustain this coordination, even on its own expenses. And the example of OPEC, um, in a way, supports this logic. Mm -hmm. this, this strategy, or at least this model of cooperation, worked for quite a long time. The only thing that um, with all the models of price leadership and dominant firm models, they usually have one and the same prediction, that sooner or later, the market share of this price leader will decrease. Mm -hmm. So to some quite long time, we can sustain coordination only based on efforts of this one price leader. But this sooner or later comes to an end. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's it for the first five pages of chapter 10. Do you have any questions about that? I would have a question, if I were you. <laughs> I would ask, OK, well, um, this model works, but only for some time. And what happens next? Yeah? OK, how can we sustain coordination? And the whole chapter later on talks about that. The next, I would say, logical step would be to say that there are, as well, instances when there is collusive behavior on the market, even though it is not coordinated. Just because the oligopolists, they simply understand that, OK, well, one guy increases the price. If I follow him, I can earn more. As simple as that. Even though I run the risk that suddenly, at some point, he can go defecting, but still, for a lo long time, we can sustain coordination. Therefore, um, there are a lot of empirical studies that show that even though um, there was no explicit agreement that is actually uh, against the law. The globe, uh, oligopolists, they managed to sustain coordination for quite a long time, even though they did not agree, to agree upon them. Mm -hmm. So achieving strategies is like short-time solution to make money based on a short period and later pay off for what you've done? Well, uh, exactly, but it's a big question how other players will um, act. I guess in chapter 9, you should have studied the strategies tit for tat, tit for two tats, or grim, uh, grim trigger strategies. So it looks like the following. Say, if we have this cartel agreement, and it is said there that if you cheat, then we utilize tit for tat. Mm -hmm. So it means that once you cheat in this period, you go defect, then in the next period, uh, I will also go defecting. Mm -hmm. Therefore, how the whole thing works? I know that for quite a long time, I can earn this 100. And then I think, well, if I defect in period n, I will get this payoff. But then in period n plus 1, in the next one, I will get only this one. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I have a trade-off. I will have to pay for my cheating. And then there is only a question of my value of money, this discount rate r. Mm -hmm. So say if I, oh, now it looks like I earn 20 and then I lose 20. Mm -hmm. But if I have a high discount rate, it means for me that this 20, um, I value it's higher than this 20 next period. Mm -hmm. So you see, this is the value of money. There is quite a broad um, part or domain of game theory that works with this infinitely repeated games. Mm -hmm. Or say, if we uh, decide that in our cartel we have an agreement that if someone cheats, someone goes defecting, then you will be punished forever after. Mm -hmm. So then it means that if I go defecting in period n, then in all periods n plus 1, n plus 2, and infinity, uh, my opponent will defect. Mm -hmm. Then 
I have to pay higher price for cheating, huh? then this instantaneous cheating will cost me much more in the long run. Mm -hmm. that, uh, there is a equilibrium point where they are earning 80 and 80. Okay, but again, I, I don't understand you. I'm they sorry. are earning 80, do 80 dollars each company. At that point, there is an equilibrium point. Yes. But uh, according to our study, that we have studied that uh, equilibrium point is a point where no none of any party can change the extra benefit, can get the extra benefit by changing its decision or output. So if they change their decision, they can earn 100 and 100 each. Why this is then equilibrium? Yeah, this is a good question. This is a question from game theory. Uh, what is uh, the um, definition of Nash equilibrium? Nash equilibrium is such a strategy profile where none of the players have an incentive to change the strategy given the strategy of another player. So what does that mean for us? Say, I'm player one. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing on this payoff. I think to myself, well, I take this strategy of player two to defect as given. Yeah? Because in definition we say, given the strategy of another player. So the strategy of another player is defect. Therefore, I think to myself, can I increase my payoff if I change my strategy? If I change from defect to collude, I only decrease. Look here. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I prefer to stand here. And it will be just the same for another one. Mm -hmm. So even though intuitively it looks like, OK, guys, this is much better, but according to the definition of Nash equilibrium, this is not an equilibrium. Mm -hmm. This is the most efficient outcome of the whole game if we look at the game from the outside. Huh? If we are an outside observer, say, I'm a policy maker, mm -hmm. and I know that there are two players on the market and so on and so forth. So I understand as a policy maker that if they play this outcome, the social welfare, everything will be just better than if they play this one. Mm -hmm. But as long as I change my perspective of looking at the game, I suddenly realize that this welfare implication for me doesn't make any sense. I am the player. I am a firm. I want to maximize my profit. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I want to be on the safe ground. I want to earn as much as I can. And I'm always better off playing and defecting. Mm -hmm. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. Especially, uh, make sure that you understand this concept of Nash equilibrium. Mm -hmm. uh, far not always, it is intuitive. In some games, it looks like, OK, yes, mm -hmm. it makes sense. But prisoner's dilemma, um, I would say it's the most paradoxical game in the whole domain of game theory. Mm -hmm. Because this result is counterintuitive. As economists, we understand that this is much better. But game theory predicts that we will play this. Mm -hmm. I think that's it for chapter 10. Mm -hmm. In the outset of the whole story, we should understand that <coughs> if we have a rational firm, a rational company, it should think not about now. It should think in the long term. Mm -hmm. So if there is a rational firm, it should maximize not a short-term profit, but a long-term profit. What does it mean? It means that, well, uh, as a monopolist, I can say, I want to maximize my profit right now in this period. And then I set up rather high price. But it attracts many other companies to come to the market. And we know from the prediction of competitive market model that sooner or later, I will come to the point when I will have my price equal to marginal costs. Mm -hmm. And my economic profit will be simply equal to zero. In the long run, therefore, I would prefer to utilize some strategies to take some actions that will deter this entry. Mm -hmm. I don't want uh, new guys to come into the market. Uh, there might be 
two options. Either I can play with the price. Mm -hmm. I can set up the price in a way that will be that the entry will not be attractive for a newcomer. Mm -hmm. Or another thing, I can utilize some non-pricing strategies, for example, some heavy advertisement or whatsoever. So chapter 11 is about strategies to deter entry based on pricing. Mm -hmm. And the next chapter, chapter 12, is about non-pricing strategy. So today we talk about prices. The first model is called limit pricing model. What does it mean? I mean that I limit my price such that the entry for another player is not attractive anymore. Mm -hmm. And the highest possible price that will still allow me to operate, but others not to come, it's called a limit price. Mm -hmm. Here we have an, an example. Imagine that there is some industry, it has total demand P-100 minus Q. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a monopolist and they have linear cost functions. Marginal cost of a monopolist is equal to average cost of a monopolist and it is equal to 40. Um, so this is my monopolist, and it has linear uh, cost function, and this is my demand function. Mm -hmm. P minus Q, and it, it summations will be 100. Mm -hmm. Well, who will help me? How do I find my maximum profit if I'm a monopolist? You go a bit too far. First of all, actually, it doesn't matter which market structure we now consider. Whatever happens, each company maximizes its profit when its marginal cost, marginal revenue. Exactly. The only question then, how to find marginal revenue? Mm -hmm. Twice a steep rule for a monopolist. So we say that marginal revenue of a monopolist is 100. Oh, brilliant. Now I, you know, <laughs> I'm confident in you. <laughs> the exam will go, okay, sure. And then we equate that to costs. Mm -hmm. So from here I get my Q equal to 40, mm -hmm. right? No, 30. Yeah, 30. And then the, pri the price will be 70 and my profit will be 900, yeah? 100 minus 70 is 30, 30 to 30 is 900. And yeah, this is my marginal revenue, this is twice a steep rule, this is a crossing between revenue and cost, and this is my equilibrium, not equilibrium, but profit maximizing payoff. Mm -hmm. So from this point I go up to the demand function, mm -hmm. and from here I find the price. And now a newcomer, a potential entrant, considers what will happen if he enters the market. Um, the model works in the following way. The logic is that, well, when a new guy comes, he considers the market demand not in the whole, but there is some residue mm -hmm. after the monopolist. So monopolist already produces this 30. So in a way, we cut off this part of the demand function. Mm -hmm. So a newcomer will face only this part of it. So and it is exactly on, uh, on this graph. So for a newcomer, potential enter, we say that his demand will be this 100 minus Q of monopolist, something that is already produced, and then minus Q of a potential entrant. Mm -hmm. So in this case, this is 70 minus Q of P E. Mm -hmm. In this model, we assume that, okay, this monopolist, he appears quite along in the market, probably he holds a patent for the production technology. 
That's why a new guy will certainly have average costs and marginal costs a bit higher than the incumbent firm. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we assume here that he faces the cost of production not 40, but 50. Mm -hmm. And now, again, we apply the, the same reasoning. Marginal costs equal to marginal revenue. Twice a steep rule. Marginal revenue of potential entrant will be 70 minus 2Q, and this is equal to 50. Mm -hmm. From here, we get Q of potential entrant equal to 10. Mm -hmm. And his price will be 60. Mm -hmm. What happens then? That, OK, the incumbent firm suddenly realizes that there is someone on the market that sets the price equal to 60. And then this mono monopolist ha has to respond to that. Mm -hmm. So at this moment, he starts as well to reduce his new price. And now it is 60 as well. Mm -hmm. So with this price 60, his new profit is 60 minus 40 multiplied by 30. And it is equal to 600. Mm -hmm. So we see that from here to here, this is 33% reduction of profit. Mm -hmm. Not that good. Then, what this guy can do? In order to prevent this entry, he can set up a price that will make uh, the entry for a newcomer not attractive at all. So here we see that if uh, the monopolist sets up the price equal to 50, um, and he will produce 50 as well then, mm -hmm. so uh, then the residual demand function for a newcomer will be P equal to 100 minus 50 and minus QPE. Huh? So this will be 50 minus QPE. And this is his residual demand function, only this piece. Mm -hmm. But his average costs lie above demand function on, on the whole length. Mm -hmm. So it means that whatever he produces now, he always sustains a loss. Mm -hmm. So in this way, I set up the limit price equal to 50. And in this way, I prevent the entry. Mm -hmm. And this is a very nice point to have a break. <laughs>